name's Alexandra. I work here at Google, and this is Roya. Um, we're going to cook a little bit for you today, but we want to talk a lot about the book that you wrote with your mom, Maman and me. So uh, we've all heard of Pandemic Babies, but um, Roya's was, she went home for what should have been a weekend of Noru celebrations, and then lockdown happened. So two and a half months at home with your parents. Some of us didn't make as good choices as she did to like, start a cookbook. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we're really excited to have you here today. And I know um, she doesn't just write cookbooks, folks. Um, also, uh, impacts and partnerships at Glossier. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, two two jobs for the price. Of, well, <laughs> kind of for the price of one. <laughs> the cookbook thing doesn't fully pay yet, but we'll see what happens in the future. Go buy the cookbook. Yeah, go buy the cookbook. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'll... Yeah. Um, okay, so we are going to cook for you in just a second. We're going to do a couple of questions first. I wanted to start out with, um, you know, when you started writing this book, I'm sure you didn't expect to be writing during a huge revolution yeah. um, back in Iran. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? And what Yeah, happened? this book was a lifelong dream of mine, definitely a thing I've thought about since I was a teenager. And over the past five years or so, I'd say in earnest, I started working on it and writing it and asking my mom for recipes. And if any of you have immigrant parents, um, you know how hard it is to get recipes out of them and that they don't have anything written down or they measure everything with like their fingers. And that's that. <laughs> we can talk more about that later. But I was, this was kind of a dream of mine. Started working on it over the past five years and was lucky enough to receive a book deal uh, and work on a book proposal back in 2021. And in really writing the book and writing recipes testing, I had no idea that about a year ago we'd see a new revolution underway in Iran, one that is still going on. Women are fighting for their equality. Really, everyone is fighting for equality. And they're being suppressed by the government. So it's not a great situation. It's not what I expected, but it also, I think, affirmed me in telling this story and sharing a positive story about Iranian culture now that so many more people are aware of what's going on and are aware of our culture. They should also see the beauty of it and not just the pain. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I went to a protest at some point and someone said, uh, who doesn't love Hormosab C on the sign? <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what yeah. I'm here for. Yeah, we have really good food. <laughs> that's really a, good food. And that's why we're here today. Awesome. Uh, let me see where we're at. Okay. So your intro to your book, like, almost brought me to tears. Guys, it's all I cried only, like, writing it. Yes, yes, I was there with you. And so um, you talk about home as not being, uh, you know, being sort of metaphysical and in all of us and um, hoping that this book helps people to immortalize home for themselves. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to cry today. We're going to try yeah. our best, but, you know, if they come out, it's okay. Um, <laughs> how has home changed for you in the last couple of years? Loaded question. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not going to cry today. <laughs> I think home is change. Home is always changing. That's my belief. And witnessing having parents who kind of left their homes behind and tried to start a new one over the course of the past 30 years has been a lot to witness. Home has been literally New York for the past like 13 years for me. But I think I feel torn between how Iranian am I? How American am I? Like, you know, I, you can never really call yourself a New Yorker unless you're born and raised here. That's my belief. Other people would say, oh, after the 10 year mark, you can, but I don't really buy that. Um, but I think home is wherever you feel most comfortable being yourself. And for me, that home is really in the kitchen or feeding people, which is lovely to be here today because never been to Google before, but it feels like home right now because we've got the turmeric, we've got the tomato paste, we've got all the ingredients. So I think, yeah, home is where you can be your most self. And for me, that's usually cooking and feeding people. Oh, incredible. All right. We will not cry today. I swear. <laughs> Um, okay, so I want to talk about, so before we get started, yeah, are there any particular ingredients that you think people should cook with more often, like underused, people should know about? A hundred percent. There's a pantry section in the cookbook that lists a bunch, but I'd say like my highlights reel, turmeric, absolutely. Use it in everything and anything. It is beautiful. It adds this rich flavor. It adds this gorgeous hue and color to things. Saffron is pricey, um, so I treat it like gold because it kind of is like gold, but I think that can be an amazing addition to your rices, to your meats, to really just like give a little bit of gorgeous aroma and again this beautiful golden hue in dishes. We, my mom does something interesting that I don't see a ton of chefs do. She always uses, cur like there's turmeric, cinnamon, 
cumin, curry powder. And curry powder is really just a blend of spices. That includes all of the above, but she's like, there's just a good balance and earthiness in that that I cannot get in these alone or these combined. So we double up on that. So those are the kind of basic essentials, I would say. Keep those stocked up and you can riff on any of these recipes. Yeah, for sure. Oh, incredible, okay. Um, you know, you can't just get the curry powder. You gotta get all the things. I know, Bump it's an it annoying answer, but it's true. <laughs> well, I think it's good to get the actual answer, right? Because otherwise True. you're just using the curry powder and you're like, why doesn't it taste yeah. like the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, restaurants and things, I'll ask uh, this one a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, is, are there any dishes that you prefer to eat out rather than to cook? For Iranian food, right? Yeah. I'd say we have a bean soup called Ush and it is like five different beans, lentils, legumes. It can be with noodles. It is the most delicious thing. It's amazing home cooked, but it's also quite the pain to make. So I'd say I prefer Osh. There's a guy in New York who started an Osh business in the corner of a pizza shop. Yeah, see, I'd, like they're like, yeah, if you know, you know, like <laughs> Saeed, Taste of Persia, he is the man and his Osh is very good. Um, I think he does home deliveries now. His business shut down during the pandemic. That Osh is excellent. Sofra in Brooklyn and Prospect Heights, excellent Osh there. And they have kind of a sister restaurant that the young chef from there is running. They don't have Osh just yet, but I assume they will in the winter. It's the best heartwarming thing and a bowl will suffice even though you'll want to eat a lot more. So I'd say that is a go-to. And then some of our desserts, if there's like a baklava situation, which I love to, I honestly like to make at home, but it's a lot of butter. It's a lot of layers of dough. It's chopping nuts finely. So I'd say that as well. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And kebab, because I don't have a grill and who has a grill in New York? So yeah. Aval has really, really good kebab. It's the best I've ever, ever, ever had. I haven't been there. It's in Bushwick. It's a little bit of a schlep. It's really cool. They have a saffron martini. Got to go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of not having a grill, are yes. there any, um, you know, we're, we're in New York and uh, you're in Brooklyn and are there any sort of space saving hacks, gadgets, anything you want to uh, help us home cooks in small kitchens with? I feel like a mortar and pestle is great because I love to grind cardamom, saffron. It's really helpful if you actually grind it into a powder, but like I don't have a spice mill. My mom uses a repurposed coffee grinder for her saffron. She's like, this is the saffron grinder now. No coffee beans will go through this. I don't have space for that. So I'd say a little, and it's the tiniest, tiniest little thing that sits on my counter. That is a game changer. I'd say a good stainless steel pot like this where I can make a full rice dish in it. I can also braise meats in it. I could pop it in the oven. Simple, space saving, but and it can be a little pricey, but like it will last you forever. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Um, I'm going to start chopping onions if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Let's. And then I might make you chop tomatoes. How comfortable are you with chopping things? Yeah. Okay. I don't love chopping things, but. You don't love it. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe, maybe. My mom always makes fun of me. She's like, you can't just chop the thing. I'm like, we need to get like a food processor or something that chops well. Well, you know, there is that like, um, I don't know what it's called. We have something where it's like a little box with slits and yes. you put stuff in it. Yes. yes, yes, like a slap chop or one of those foldable ones. Those ones aren't bad. I don't have one personally because I don't have space. However, that will get your prep done really yeah. quick. If you don't like chopping, but like, I feel like it's cathartic. That's fair. I don't know. Some people might disagree. I also like, I'm so paranoid about cooking on camera now. I've been doing all these TV shows for our book launch and it's just different when there's like eyes of people watching you, you know? And I'm a lefty, which is odd in the kitchen, but. When I was making the questions, I was like, okay, no jump scares. We can't lose a finger here today. That would be a, so. a wicked way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's talk a bit about, oh, so I was reading your cookbook and yeah. I saw, um, obviously there's a lot of um, recipes from your mother. There's also some recipes um, from a friend named Mona yeah. and um, you referenced like your, your grandmother and things like that, Yeah. Um, which was a little bit weird for me because, because in my family, all the men cook. And so, okay, feminism. I love that. <laughs> um, That's yeah. the future we want. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, women, life, freedom. Yeah. And so, I'm like, uh, don't, don't make us cook, please. <laughs> um, were there any dishes that like your Baba or maybe his, you know, brothers or anything are famous for? Well, family? it's well to ask my Baba and his brothers because my dad is one of eight boys. 
Just it seems to happen all the time. My dad's one of four boys. What is that? Yeah, I have like 25 first cousins on that side alone. I feel like, and most of them are in Iran, but my dad is here. My dad is like, it's so stereotypical. He's like the grill master. He's like, I've got, I've got the kebabs. I've got this on deck. And I'm like, what if you made a stew? And he's like, no, I would rather not do that. <laughs> so I'd say he's a grill master, but he's also like the breakfast king. And like, he loves the like, a lot of these breakfast dishes are really accessible. They're not as glam as I'd say like other, you know, cookbooks from the region might be. It's like hot dog and egg scramble. Yeah. But it's so good. If yeah. you're tired, if you don't have anything in your fridge, they're the kind of things you can whip up. Or if you're hungover, they're very, very, very good. So Excellent. breakfast and grilling mostly. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, should we? Yeah, let's, if that's, yeah, let's I don't think it's some hot. beautiful. It's we can put yet. that on medium heat. So as you've seen, I've chopped an onion. <sighs> can be a rough chop, it really doesn't matter. You're gonna cook it down for a few minutes on medium heat with some olive oil. So once that pan gets oh, a no. little... You know how after a while you can only use your own stove? Yeah, do you have a favorite burner? Like the bottom oh, bottom yeah. left is my go-to burner. Well, on mine, it's the middle one. That's I, chaotic. I, mine is the biggest one, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. That is wild. Okay, do Excellent. you have a gas or electric stove? Gas, but I really want induction. Oh, okay. But, you know, rent, so. Rent. Yeah, my parents recently switched to an induction because their electric stove of like the past 20 years burnt out. And yeah. my mom was very cynical. She was like, I'm a, I'm a good cook. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to pop that in there, it's fine. And we'll wait until it gets a little shimmery and then pop the onions in. She just recently, you can put a little bit more. Don't worry. Beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit more. It's olive oil. We're okay. It's not butter. But also, I love butter, and butter makes everything taste better. Yeah, so sure. that's beautiful. And do you need this? Are your hands a little oily? You're good? Oh, no, I'm good. I've somehow missed all of the oil. Beautiful. I mean, <laughs> we, we do tech, so like live demos are never the thing you want to do, but so far. So far, so good, hopefully. Yeah, don't ask me to code, but um, you can ask me to cook. Uh, she just switched, so my mom just switched to an induction stove and it's changed her life. And every time I go there, I'm like, this is too powerful for like a human like me to be using. Like it boils water in three minutes flat. Like pasta comes together so quick. Yeah. It's so scientific. And then the, the second you take it off, the heat is gone. Like you can touch that burner and you don't feel a thing. Yeah. It's shocking. Magnets, the way's the future. It's, yeah, it is the future. But gas is great. I love gas. And I think, um, Gas is amazing for making tadig or crispy rice because you just get a nice, consistent flame. I feel like with electric burners, I don't have quite the same luck. When I first asked my father how to make tadig, he was like, okay, tell me about your, your stove. stove. That's, that's <laughs> the right question. See, okay, so no wonder men in your family really knew how to cook. Yeah. You guys are all in. And in this bowl right here, we have two potatoes. We soak them in water. It's a nice step. It prevents them from getting brown gets rid of some of the excess starch too. So it's just, if you have time to do it, it's great. Soaking your rice is also great, but um, we're making, we didn't even talk about what we're making. So not to like bury the lead here, we're making this gorgeous rice pilaf that Carlos has already prepared a big batch of that maybe you'll see in a corner somewhere. It's a rice pilaf with turmeric, tomatoes, potatoes, in our language, it's called Estamboli, which just means it comes from Istanbul. It's like a Turkish dish. Yeah. Um, Estamboli polo. People make it all sorts of different ways. This is my like one pot wonder, the thing I want to clean out my pantry or I have nothing in the fridge. That's what I'm going to end up using here. So cooking down onions for a few minutes, let them get translucent. We're going to chop this potato next and pop that in there Perfect. and then we'll keep going. But keep the questions coming while I chop this potato. Okay, so you mentioned, you know, this is uh, Estambulipo, and uh, my favorite is, uh, and I'm going to butcher this just a little bit, I didn't grow up using the, the guttural sound. We're, we're um, the, never too late. Um, Bacalipolo. <laughs> Bacalipolo, yeah. so good. Uh, um, the dill rice with the fava beans, if you have not had it, please go have it. It's it's a wonder and something we like to have on Nowruz, which is Persian New Year, which yeah. happens in March of every year, the start of spring. Beans and, the, and the herbs. Kick off of uh, your time at home during yeah. the pandemic. Yeah, that is the happy anniversary of when I thought I was going home for a weekend and ended up staying for two months. Yeah. Um, but a cookbook came out of that and a viral TikTok account and a big Instagram account. So, so yeah, I wanted silver to talk lines. A bit, um, about content creation. I know, sure. um, you know, I was looking at your. Um, your Instagram, and you're not just about Iranian food. There's also, you know, a bit of a tastemaker over here. Oh, okay. Uh, I was like, oh, look at these brands. I will, uh, I will take that. Thank you. <laughs> but I wanted to know, um, 
you know, your mom's is, is private and you guys have uh, one together, <laughs> Maman and me. Yeah. I want to know how uh, your relationships changed since you Ooh. became content creators and worked together. Loaded question. Um, I got more. <laughs> I know. So spicy for this early in the morning. I'd say our relationship, it's like mother-daughter relationships and parental relationships are always a challenge and then throw in like deciding to become creative collaborators and authors together and it's like you're adding a ton of you know gasoline to the to a fire um i'm lucky i feel like i'm very close with my mom we're very similar which in some respects is amazing because i feel like we get each other we understand each other in other respects she's a hothead and i'm a hothead and we're both have very strong opinions about yep. about food um so there were disagreements i'd say it was the best thing and also one of the hardest things uh shooting a cookbook is no joke and we spent the entire month of july every weekend shooting 10 recipes a day every yeah every weekend 80 recipes eight days um who did you invite over to eat friends family and also like weird family can throw down like they can eat quite a bit because we're lucky enough to have my mom as a cook so there was that and we had an amazing photographer with us but it was just like manual labor 12 hours at a time being in the kitchen sweating and then yep. plating things making them look nice the photographer being like i want your hands in this shot i'm like oh like, okay like, oh god <laughs> suddenly you're getting really self-conscious about your hands yeah oh like, yeah like, yeah like i'm like, like are my nails done like or how are my bracelets um how does one hold this dish yeah how do, yeah god knows i don't know um, we popped the potatoes in there. I want to let those cook for about three or four minutes. Let them get a little soft. We're not trying to like fry them or steam them, but at the same time, we just need them to get a little bit of cooking in before we then add rice, water, etc., etc. And I'll chop the garlic in the meantime. I'm so glad you're doing that one. <laughs> I, yeah, I decided that I wasn't going to ask you to chop after you said I don't like chopping. I'll, I'll do the tomatoes simple. if you want. I, if they splash on me, I'll be fine. Same okay. color. Okay, okay. I love that. I respect <laughs> that. I didn't wear white for that reason today, so thank you. Um, all right. Where are we? Okay. When I first started, you know, cooking for myself, um, I, the first time I made bocoli polo, uh, I did Was that like the first thing you tried to it, make? It definitely was. I definitely thought like... This is the, the big one. I'll just go in there, do it. You are oh. so brave. <laughs> or delusional. Either one. But I think being brave means being delusional. And so... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'll take it. I'll yeah. take it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's my second book. That's the self-help book I'll come out with after this. <laughs> just a pinch of delusion. Yeah. Um, a so... sprinkle of delulu. Beautiful. I tried to make it. I didn't arrange it. So when you when you steam the Persian rice, you have to like make a, a mound, put the holes in it. I, I just I messed up something, and uh, so I ended up the bottom was just mush and the top was hard. And Ooh. my brain, I swear <laughs> they they let me into Google for a reason. <laughs> but my brain went, okay, one's too soft, one's too hard. I'll just mix it together. Ooh, so, remix. Okay, interesting. So it's basically like mushy rice with flecks of hard rice. And okay. I, and what was I supposed to do? Incredible. So was there ever a time that you made oh, a completely always. unsolvageable dish? Literally always. That's like that's the beauty and joy of cooking is it's a you know it's a little bit of an art and a science and you can try to get everything right but your heat source might be bad, your pan might be bad, your ingredients might not be the best, or you just lose track of time and you you mess it up. So my life. Yeah, it happens. I think no matter how much I cook, no matter how much I spend time in the kitchen, perfecting the crispy rice, that taddy crust, is the thing that will constantly scare the heck out of me. This is being recorded. Every like, time. I don't know if I can curse here. Oh, I was going to ask that at the beginning. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it scares the heck out of me. Yeah. Um, I never know how it's going to turn out. And I'd say like I have a pretty good rep for making a solid taddy at this point in time. But I'm still scared every time I flip it. And there are times where it's a little burned or like it ends up a little flat. But yeah. I've just learned that like this is the process and it's not always going to be perfect. And I'm just happy that I can make something like it. Anyway. Every teddy is beautiful teddy. Okay, another self-help book in the works. <laughs> that's, that's book three. If you burn your rice, it's still beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just be delusional. Um, so, oh. yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you earlier. I totally forgot. Um, we talked a bit about the different rices and what their names are, and um, how did you reconcile naming conventions? 
That was Just, tough because I wanted to have names that made sense to folks who had never tried Iranian food, folks who maybe tried something similar and also didn't want to diss any Iranians who were like, this isn't what it's called. So I decided to, which like we have a lot of that in our community, but I think, you know, it's fair, it's valid. Um, but my book is not super traditional either. So it's bound to, you know, frustrate some folks who want things to be a certain way. Yep. Anyway, every recipe has like a anglicized an English name. And then it has in parentheses the Iranian component. Yeah, so yeah. like this is technically called turmeric rice with tomatoes and potatoes. We call it Istanbuli. There's like wonton wrapper, samosas that we call sambusas, and we don't, you know, call out the fact that it's made with wonton wrappers, but like that's what we could do, and that's what we figured out after yeah. immigrating to this country. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a mix of everything. I call an eggplant an egg dish that we talked about earlier. Yes, I call it eggs plant. Like there's eggs yeah, and eggplant, like just make it, it like it's like just keep it simple, keep it easy, and that's that's all you really need. Yeah. And I told you before, I went to a, a Michelin star rated Persian restaurant in the city. What was this restaurant? It was um it's on Sorry, not to, throw, not to throw them under the bus or anything. Anyway, I went in and I was like, Oh, does your Mirzaka Semi have eggs in it? And they were like, No one makes Mirzaka Semi with eggs the in it. And I was like, literally eggplants and eggs. That I was is like, so what? shocking to me. I was like, my uncle is famous. For, he's like, your uncle doesn't know. I was like, if you go to a Persian restaurant, they will talk about your family as if they know them. Be like, you're, yeah, your family knows nothing. I could, they could know that I'm the cookbook author, and they'd be like, you're doing it wrong. So you, you, you have yeah. brought shame yeah. to our people. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, sometimes it's like it's weird having an Instagram account. So our Instagram has like 126,000 followers. Our TikTok has almost 200,000. And at that point, when you grow that big, I guess you're bound to have some haters. Which is rough. Yeah. People are like, oh, like she, you, why are you celebrating this burned rice? And I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like this is, <laughs> this, is our, this is our culture. <laughs> How dare you? We throw it in the garlic if you already noticed that it smells incredible now. This miracle combination of things, onions, garlic, uh, and olive oil is all you need. So really stir in that tomato paste. You want it to get, you want it to touch everything. You want it to dissolve. And you want it to turn like a br a little bit of like a brick red brown because tomato paste is technically kind of raw and you'll get that raw flavor if you don't cook it. Um, and once we caramelize that tomato paste, we're gonna add some spices in and then we're gonna add our rice in. But, um, so you get a bunch of haters when you grow to a certain point on the internet, which is shocking. It's like wholesome mother and daughter cooking, but there's still people who have, you know, strong opinions on everything. Yeah. How dare you? How dare they and how um. dare I? Um, I forgot to say, if, if anyone has questions, we are going to take a couple at the end, so I can start thinking now. Um, I only have a couple more, so you're going to have to save me from... Yeah, please ask me anything. Um, all right. And then piggybacking off the above, you talk a bit about how your mother was down like near the sea, and so some of the yeah. recipes are more based on that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. How did you... Like, where did you say, okay, this is, you know, authentic, <laughs> this is uh, fusion... Yeah, it's a, it? it's like a corny cliched answer, but almost just like home is always, you know, home is where you feel comfy. Authenticity is what feels right to you. I feel like that's maybe scandalous in the food world and like the generation that came before me has, a, especially in the Iranian community, has a very specific point of view of this is authentic because this is the way it was done by my grandparents and my parents. Yep. Um, and this cookbook is going to flip that concept on the head because authentic is using wonton wrappers because you can't find samosa wrappers because you can't be bothered to make them yourself. It's, you know, throwing the hot dogs and eggs because you don't have Iranian sausage here. It's putting cardamom and orange peel in your French toast or rose water in your pancakes or in your whipped cream. Um, and that feels authentic to me. And it's like keeping turmeric in my pantry, something we talked about earlier, is how I'm gonna, you know, add it into my scrambled eggs or add it into something else that I'm cooking that might not be Iranian, but that's my way to inject a little bit of where I come from into what I'm cooking. So. Authenticity is whatever you want it to be. Uh, some people won't like that answer, but that's okay. Like, I it's, think it's okay to prioritize actually making the food as opposed to perfecting yeah. it. Yeah, so now we're popping in the spices. We've got turmeric, we've got cumin, we've got curry powder. It smells so good. This is the curry powder. This is the oh. cumin. I have a light touch with cumin. Other people love it. Red chili flakes or any kind of like tiny pepper is great in this. I just throw a little, well, a little generous, but that's okay. 
And then salt and pepper. Some chefs like to like season every layer. I kind of change it up depending on what, what I'm cooking and when I'm cooking. But with rice, it is important that you salt your ingredients and salt it at the upfront because it's hard to quite add that flavor in afterwards. And yeah. don't worry, I know you see some caramelization on the bottom of the pot. You're scraping it up, which is great, but that is, there's a ton of flavor in there. Yeah. And once we add liquid to this pot, it's gonna just oh, good. be the most beautiful thing. So I'm gonna pop in the salt here and then we're gonna add in our rice. We have, I think, about two cups of rice in this. You can scale this recipe up and down. Carlos has scaled it up really beautifully for all of you. And then stir that all in. See, you know, when I make uh, Persian food with my family, right, if there's like a million people at the table. Here, I'm gonna stir you. Oh, go ahead. We talk. No, you been, you, you've been working hard. Um, and so, you know, when I was reading the recipes and they were like a couple cups, I was like, no, no, like the whole bag. The uh, whole bag. Oh, that was another disagreement we had of like scaling things down where yes. my mom's like minimum five cups of rice. And I'm like, no, no person is going to do that. Like we're lucky if they have five cups in their pantry, yep. let alone yep. want to cook five cups of uncooked rice on any given day. <laughs> Oh, this is an interesting one about um, TikTok, and that is, uh, did you ever have to change a recipe because, like those haters say, like you thought it would be a little too um, foreign for some people? I don't know if I change things based on them being foreign. There are some recipes that are like so damn complicated and hard that I felt, sorry, I curse. Um, <laughs> so complicated and hard that I felt like it wasn't worth including in this book, and maybe if there's a future book, we'd have it. So. You can throw a little bit more in. I'm aware we're limited, we have like limited space in this pot, so we might not use all these precious tomatoes, but that is okay. I'll just start snacking on them. Here. Honestly, salt on tomatoes, it's an Iranian snack. Salt on tomatoes and cucumbers, that's, that's like after school cooking. Um, sure. But it wasn't so much foreign, but it was like difficulty. So like we have a dessert called Sholazard, which is like saffron rice pudding that requires a ton of effort and not everybody has that effort. Or halva is another one that requires a ton of effort. I saw you guys making it. Huh? Stirring, yeah, constantly for hours. Stirring flour, oil, like clarified butter together. Do we have a ladle? I'm worried I'm gonna, I'm gonna put someone or myself in the splash zone. Oh, behind us. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, that's good. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, so mostly for difficulty, and this water is not completely going to deglaze, but it is going to get some of that delicious, crispy, caramelized goodness at the bottom of that pot, and it's going to kind of incorporate it into the rest of the rice. Um, we're lucky here that we have this water simmering. I would use like my electric kettle, probably another good kitchen gadget to keep the water warm and then just pop it into the rice so it starts to boil quickly and we can let it cook. Excellent. All right, well, folks are eating in here. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Go ahead. Um, it's like Mike coming to you. Okay. It seems like you incorporate, uh, you know, ingredients that are uh, testing. It seems like you you kind of challenge the notion of authentic. Yeah. So have you ever challenged like the techniques in which you use? For example, like if I were to try to make your dish, I would potentially cook the rice separately first Ooh. and then and then mix it in because I'm used to cooking the rice in a rice cooker, not yeah. like as you're doing it. So I'm curious if you have switched up your techniques to, to reinvent or challenge the notion of authenticity being a, uh, an American with a, with, a, yeah. with a heritage from a different country. I love that question so much. And the answer is absolutely yes. And for me, it's always for ease. And it's probably a product of living in New York, having a tiny apartment, like not necessarily having all the, thank you so much, Chef. Um, not having all the space I need. So like that Osh soup that we have, like I think we say dried beans in the recipe. And I mentioned in the head, and my mom was adamant. She was like, dried beans, don't say canned. And I was like, we use canned, girly. Like, what are you talking about? And she's like, no, the, the community will like disown me. And I was like, okay. Anyway, so like canned beans instead of dried. For me, I'm gonna use that hack like 100% of the time because I don't have time to soak and to wait. Uh, for rice and rice cookers, it's interesting. Persian rice cookers have a setting. Now we've added the water, it's already come to a boil. We're gonna, eh, we can let it cook open for a little bit. I'll let some of it drain, then I'll pop the lid on. Um, 
Persian rice cookers can make that tahdig perfectly every time. So you could throw all these ingredients in there and then come out with it. And I love to do that sometimes. But again, it can't be what I put in the cookbook. I feel like canned beans is one hack. Techniques are another hack. I'm trying to think of the things I do that are frowned upon by my mom, who's like, I'm gonna do it the long and hard way. I use like labna on toast instead of cream cheese. And like, I think, yes, yeah, switching up the techniques is great. And it's just about what works for you. So like, yes, you're used to using a rice cooker, do it. And then like simmer these ingredients separately. And maybe when the rice is about five minutes from done, stir it all together and see what happens. But I would, this will stay in your pot, but I would put like the turmeric, cumin, curry powder, I'd put that with the rice. And so your rice still turns yellow and still cooks with the spices, just might not cook with those like tomato, potato, onions, which is totally fine. Hi, Roya. I'm Roya too. I love meeting another Roya. It's so <laughs> rare. Me too. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, I have two questions. One being, sure. did you just grow up cooking with your mom, like from a very young age, or did you later and then you mentioned measuring with your finger Ugh. my grandmother always is like you put this much you know and I'm like what is this yeah. and so how did you translate that into the Ooh, <laughs> amazing questions I did grow up cooking with my mom when I was about four or five years old we took a mommy and me cooking class at like our local community center and it was a lot of like American staples that we just did not know how to make. We did not make French toast or pancakes as a family unless it came from like Bisquick box mix. Like that was not a thing we did. And so that started teaching us the essentials. After that, every Sunday we started making pancakes, French toast together. And then she started adding, oh, what if we tried a pinch of cardamom here? What if we put rose water here? And we started making it our own. So it started from a young age. And basically once I was as tall as I could reach the stove at a safe height, I was kind of in there stirring, cooking, and being my mom's shadow in the kitchen. And to your point about measuring with fingers and how do you do that, that was, other than shooting all the recipes and making all of them, I think that was the hardest bit of the cookbook. My mom has no measurements, she has nothing written down. And she'd be cooking and testing a recipe and she'd just put in a little bit of salt. And I was like, wait, what was that? Like, how much was that? I have the tablespoons and teaspoons right here. And she's like, oh no, it's fine. I'm like, it's not fine. People are gonna make this at home and it's not gonna be salty enough. Um, it was forcing her, it was literally following her in the kitchen with spoons being like, do it, do it. And like she's putting water in the rice. I'm like, how much? She's like up to this, this finger. And I'm like, that is not a measurement. I cannot tell the cook to put their finger in the rice. <laughs> and wait until it gets to the second band. Um, so it was a lot of force, it was a lot of disagreements, but thankfully we got to a place where we actually have recipes and quantities, which that was probably my biggest fear writing the book, that like the recipes wouldn't work or we would just would not have quantities for them. Yeah, of course, great questions. Hi, um, it's kind of a two-part question, so and it's piggybacking off of that one. Um, one, what was the creative process like selecting the recipes that that were going to go into the book yeah. and two um were there any recipes that you really wanted and your mom didn't and vice versa yeah absolutely the process so when you write a book proposal for a cookbook and regular book proposals look a little different they ask for a full list of recipes so like i don't even know if i'm going to have a publisher like me but i have to figure out what are the 50 plus recipes that i'm going to put in this book so I had an idea from early on. I workshopped it with my mom back and forth, but then we'd both lose sleep over it. And she'd wake up and be like, what about this dish? And be like, oh, you're right. Like, we got to do that one. Or we'd argue about whether or not to do it. So I had to figure out what are the essentials? What do I feel like people need to have? And then what are the nice to haves? And what are the like unique my family twists or my twists that I feel like need to be in here? And then I started looking at other cookbooks from the region and there were like every person has like a beautiful gorma sabzi, which is like the green kidney bean and beef stew. That's like one of the most famous Iranian dishes. But like not everybody has this rice pilaf because it's like not as glamorous or not as sexy or not as famous, or not as hard. And I'm like, this is just as just as credible as any of our other dishes. That the is the, the gorma sabzi. Which one? Is um, it? And it is so, so, so good. But there's so many other recipes that you might not see, whether it is this chorak emorok, which is like the most basic chicken stew, another one pot wonder. I love this recipe. It is everyday humble food. And I think that food is just as credible and valuable as your stews that are gonna simmer for four or five hours or 
that are the famous things. My mom makes shrimp scampi and puts saffron in it. And I'm like, we need to celebrate that. And we call it escampi because everything with, <laughs> everything with an S has to start with the O uh sound before it. There's also espaghetti, which is, um, that's like the Iranian Italian thing that again, you don't see it in cookbooks, but like this is something we eat all the time. So finding that list of recipes and finessing it was definitely a challenge. And then even while we we're photographing and you make like a tad, you can make a crust with the spaghetti. It's phenomenal. Um, Finessing that list, even going up to the point of shooting the cookbook, my mom would be like, we need to include this dessert. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, we're, we're going to photograph this tomorrow. Like, I have to go back to the publisher. And on this specific dessert, this is the, to your second question, she was like, my grandma made this. I'm like, you never made this for us growing up? <laughs> so we get into a little bit of a tiff, and I say, look, if you want to make this and it's amazing, we will put it in the cookbook. If you make it and it's just fine compared to the other ones, like, I don't know if it'll make it. And she, again, hothead like me, she got in the kitchen, she was working it, figuring it out, made this cookie, and I was like, this is one of the best things I've ever tasted. How have I never had this in my life? Mm -hmm. And then we pitched it to the publisher, and thankfully they were okay with it, and we knocked, you know, knocked something out of consideration. So that was one specific one. What was it? It's called Noon Musti, and it's like a yogurt fritter. So it's like a beautiful half moon crescent, almost like a donut. And yogurt is the leavening agent, which is so interesting. It's not like baking powder or baking soda or yeast even. Uh, it's right around there. You've got it. Yep, that's it. And I looked up this, I used Google, and I looked up this recipe because I'm like, I've never heard of this. It was nowhere to be found. So I'm like, this is a family recipe going back, I don't know how many generations. We actually need to preserve this. So that disagreement led to this beautiful kind of happy ending. There are recipes my mom is probably embarrassed by a little bit. There's like a chips and must, which is chips and Greek yogurt. It is our after school snack. I had it for dinner last night, like embarrassing to admit that, but it's, it's so good. It's like yogurt and sour cream or mayo or whatever you have to just make it a little creamier, salt, pepper, Italian seasoning, a little bit of lemon or lime juice. It should be like the first or second one in the Mazza and snacks. There's the roast nuts and then I think the mm, stuff dates. dates. We're so close. I feel it. And I think I have this thing memorized, but I guess Gonna... not. Ah, here we go. There it is. And there's my hand uh, dipping the ruffles into it. Excellent. And she's like, are we really going to put this in the cookbook? And I'm like, yes, this is how we eat. So those were a little bit of the dynamics. And I think there's always a fear of what will the community think? And I'm like, we're not... I mean, we are making this for the community, but we're also making this for us, and we're making this for people who have never had this before, and that's valid too. Any other question? Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, this was delicious, what we just ate, and realizing it's, um, thank you, it's vegetarian. Yes. Two questions. What is the best Persian vegetarian dish to impress people? Ooh. And then the second question, can you make Gorma Sabzi vegetarian or will it not be good? What about the other dishes? There is an awesome Instagram account called the Iranian Vegan and I would check out their page because their Instagram is popping off with great reels and like she's using soy protein in a Gorma Sabzi. So I think yes. Also Gorma Sabzi has kidney beans in it already. So my hunch is like you've got the protein like just go for it and you could put like a a chunky vegetable or you could put like a jackfruit in there if you wanted to emulate the texture of meat but i don't even think it needs meat something like a stamboli i love to pair with black beans or pinto beans and just like treat it almost like a rice and bean situation which is not how we grew up eating it but it just works like the flavors work um in terms of other amazing iranian vegetarian dishes fesenjun is one that we made vegetarian and it's this pomegranate molasses walnut stew it's sour sweet and really rich we made that one veggie with squash. We did gheme veggie, which is another great one. It's got split chickpeas. Again, it's already got the protein. We use these gorgeous little mushroom caps to substitute instead of the meat. So you have something chewy, you have something there, but you have full protein. I'd say like half of the recipes, if not slightly more, are vegetarian in the book and easily adaptable if they aren't. Um, and I think there's so much vegetables and legumes in our cuisine that you're not going to miss the meat too much. So I'd say like go for it and try it all. And you can always use beyond or substitutes there that are also going to be great, but you don't necessarily even need to for some of these. Of I've been vegan for 15 years and I've used a ton of different techniques to make things Amazing. vegan. I really appreciated it in the book that oh. it was marked. Yeah, of course. And so, Any other questions? Y'all have such good questions. I'm so happy. Well, I did miss one. Let's go for it. It's a, it might be a fun one. 
Um, so if, if you know, in Iranian culture, there is Torah, a Torah, which is the like... <laughs> Ritual politeness or like chivalry. It's like a hallmark of our culture. It's very rare. I see you shaking your head. You're like, oh God, like PTSD. <laughs> um, it is the sort of thing where someone comes to your house and you offer them your bed and you sleep on the floor. And that's like, that's what you should do. If someone, if you're taking someone out to lunch, you insist on paying the bill. And like whoever's older technically by rule should be paying, but no one pays attention to that. And you get into big arguments over the check and it's embarrassing for everyone. My father, uh, his dad and his uncle were fighting over the bill for like a 30 person table. Oh my God. And they're fighting over it. And while they're fighting over it, my dad just paid the bill. And he was like, I thought I was going to be murdered that night. Yeah, yeah, like, like Everyone was mad at me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but have you ever had a situation where you should have toroughed and you didn't? Oh my God. Uh, probably my <laughs> my book signing in DC, April, my publicist was there like two, three nights ago, where I, you go to these events and like, as the cook, you don't eat. Like you, I spend all day making food and then I spend the event talking and like ensuring people have food. And so like, I was becoming ravenous while signing books and I'm like, I can't be hangry while doing this. And someone was like, would you like a piece of cake? And I was like, I want three pieces of cake. This is going to be my dinner. So I definitely should have tar up. But then as I was signing the books, people kept taking my piece of cake. And so I just was like, uh, uh. like, this cake is so good. Thank you so much. So that was a, I, I could not help myself. I could not be polite in that scenario. So that is a very recent example of that. Oh, and I was going to ask, you know, you're at Guase, and, and I, I recently saw um, an Iranian um, beauty company. I mean, you know, we were talking, as with a, you know, steaming all the spices onto me, and I was like, oh, man. Yeah, like, you're a small exactly. <laughs> There's an Iranian beauty company, June, is that the one you saw, or is there another one? It might one? be. I, There's like a hair care brand that they make hair products with sumac and pomegranate yeah. molasses and saffron. It is very cool. Yeah. Um, but do you want to know about Iranian beauty traditions, or...? Obviously I do, okay. My grandma was like a beauty queen and she aged really gracefully into her 80s without like sunspots or wrinkles. She was SPF all day, every day, like a, kind of ahead of her time. Um, and she used Nivea cream, the really thick emollient cream every day. But she also made my grandpa make sweet almond oil from scratch. So like boiling sweet almonds for hours, distilling the oil from them. And then he, she made him massage it into her face. Again, like that's love. Feminism. That is love. That's love. That's what we're all looking for. Um, so her, her thing was like, stay moisturized, stay hydrated. And she says, everything I eat, I should be able to put on my face. So like she'd make the chips and yogurt and then she'd stash yogurt and then just do a mask. And she's like, it's got lactic acid, like I'm exfoliating. Anytime she peeled a cucumber, the peels went on our faces, chests and like arms. And we just sit there for 20 minutes. A peach, the peel of it, again, she's like, this is, what is it? What is the acid in fruit? Not lactic acid, citric acid? No, there's Glycon. an acid. There's some acid in some fruits. Put, put it on the face. And so while I don't take that specific approach, because I think the fruits were of a much higher quality in her time, in her country, uh, I try to stay moisturized and stay <laughs> hydrated and use my SPF and use Nivea cream, which always takes me back to her. Oh, awesome. Um, let me see if I've got anything else. Um, no other questions here? How's our rice doing? I think yeah. it's probably doing well. We need a we're looking good. Ooh. It's the water's got to got to drain a little bit, but I think a few more minutes and this should be good to go. Excellent. But you already have some, so please help yourself. Nusha John is how we say bon appetit. It means may this food nourish your soul. Very deep, very poetic. I, I have a hopefully fun question. Yeah. Since you've made this book or put it together, have people asked you to come and cook for their events, or do you do that? I would consider doing it. I feel like I've done it like socially for friends. I've done a few pop-ups in Brooklyn at different like cafes and spots that I, I kind of go to. I don't know. I like, I'm curious of like what's going to happen next. Like, will I be, will I have another book that I work on? Will I do more writing? Will I do more cooking? Will I, you know, like try to be an events cook? I'm not quite sure. I mean, we've been cooking for all of our book tour events. We've had like a ton of April knows, Kash Kebab in June, Salad Shirazi, Kuku Sabzi. Been making things for everyone. So not yet so much, but a little bit. Yeah. Anything else, y'all? Also, it's so cool you have an Iranian ERG. I mean, Glossier is a, like a startup. We are 200 employees. We have like one ERG, which is great. But the fact that your company is large enough and supportive enough to do that is the coolest thing. 
Um, Excellent. Well, I think we can wrap up then. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see all the self-help books, you yes. know, every yes. tarig is a beautiful tarig. Sometimes brave, my mother... Brave is delusional. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I heard another one, uh, my, uh, maybe my mother wouldn't agree with this recipe, <laughs> yeah. you know. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> memoir. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my biography. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think you just talked a little bit about what's next, so I think, um, yeah, we're really, really overjoyed to have you here at Google. Thank you for making food. Thank y'all for Thank also you, like, Carlos, Chef Marianne. You guys are amazing. Delicious. Thanks for being here. And um, yeah, have a great day. All.